so I'm Holly Cummins. Um, I should say as well that this talk um, was written with Martijn Verberg, who some of you who are in the Java side of the London tech community may know. Um, so I've sort of, I've optimized him out of the speaking process, but many of the, um, the good slides in here are his. Um, so I work for IBM. I'm in the cloud garage, um, which is really, we're a part of IBM that does cool things, new things, first of a kind things. Our mission is to help customers get the most out of the cloud. Um, getting the most out of the cloud isn't always as easy as it seems. Um, there's such a lot of new technology, so we we're working with that new technology, helping customers figure it out. Um, we do small projects, large projects. Um, and one of the things that we have um, in the cloud garage is what we call the cloud garage method. And this is a set of practices. Some of them will be really familiar to, to, um, to you here, things like continuous delivery, continuous integration, um, development practices like test-driven development. And we also bring in a lot of lean methodologies, hypothesis testing, that kind of thing, and a user focus. So we do a lot of design thinking. And we take all of this stuff and we've got a website which is the Garage Method website. Um, and it's got a whole bunch of practices and one of the practices on there is a fun work environment. Um, so what that means is that I'm actually someone who is professionally, you know, my job description says I have to have fun. Um, and, and as Joe mentioned, you know, there's sort of, when I give this talk, I always wonder, so, so why are you here? And, and are there a bunch of really miserable people down on the fourth floor and you're the sort of the fun half of the audience? Or, or you know, did you come here because you thought this was a talk that would be fun? Um, but there's actually sort of a subtle word distinction because this isn't a talk that is fun. This is a talk that's about fun. Um, and there's a definite <laughs> difference. Um, <laughs> that may not have been obvious, you know, obviously, it may not be obvious, but, but hopefully it's obvious now. Um, and because fun is really important, we have to take it seriously. And so if we take it seriously, then there's a whole bunch of management best practices that we have to do. So the first is, if you didn't measure it, it doesn't exist. So we need to think about what are we going to measure. We need to quantify and qualify our fun metrics. Once we've got these metrics, we need to think about, well, who, who, who owns those? Because, you know, we measure it, but then we have to do something with it. So create a chief fun officer role. So that's your CFO. You may get some confusion between the CFO and the CFO, but they can just fight in an alley or something to sort it out. Gamify your daily tasks to make them more fun. And I don't mean gamify some tasks. I mean gamify all of your tasks to make them more fun. And you may find that you're missing a task or two, and that's where your CFO comes in to make sure that you're gamifying every single task. No task left ungamified. It's about how you interact with your colleagues. It's about the atmosphere that you create. So you want to make sure that work is a place of fun. And one really good way to do that is to high five your colleagues every morning. Hey, buddy, high five. Hey, buddy, high five. And for bonus points, again, because you know your CFO will be watching, you could high five five them twice just so you know, get a little bit of extra fun credit. And it's about the work atmosphere. So we, um, in one of the earlier talks, you know, there was a we're talking about how to change culture and that you know we can move to a space that has lots of pale wood. That's a really good starting point for changing culture. Um, the next step past that is to move to a space that has ball pits and other sort of fun accoutrements to make sure that people are, are you know, knowing that this is a place where fun is not just allowed, but enforced. So the next one is about how you speak to each other. You know, have, have a fun word of the day like octopus or orangutan that you use. You know, see if you can get it into your commit messages. See if you can get it into your bug reports. And, you know, again, gamify it so your CFO can measure how often you're using the fun word. And they can give gold stars and that kind of thing for those who are most compliant with the fun word of the day. It's about how, we, how you dress. So, you know, many years ago, there, there was... Um, an IBM manual on, on how to be an IBM. Or so I should say this was like 70 years ago, not 20 years ago. Um, but it had things like you had to wear sock suspenders to work. Because if you didn't wear sock suspenders to work, your socks might droop a bit at the ankle. And then people would think, well, they're not really a serious software professional if they've got droopy socks. And then we sort of relaxed that, and we didn't have to have the sock suspenders. But we, you know, we still did have this culture in the, in the 80s where you know, everybody wore suits to work. And then we relaxed that again, and we said, hey, we're tech people. We're a bit cooler than that. We're not going to wear a suit. We're going to wear hoodies. Um, and hoodies became the new uniform. But you know, hoodies are a bit like agile, that they're sort of the new orthodoxy. And so in order to be really innovative, you have to move 
beyond that. So a hoodie is not good enough. What you need to wear is you need to wear purple bill bottoms with a rainbow striped top and dealy bobbers. You know, that, that's one example. You may want to choose some, a uniform that's appropriate for your work culture, but it's got to be fun. And again, you've got to make sure that people stick to it. So your chief fun officer can do that. And as I mentioned, at this point, you've got a lot of metrics, you've got a lot of different moving parts, a lot of different ways that people are having fun. How do you know if it's working? How do you know who's bought in and who's maybe resisting this cultural change? And so at that point, you can have the fun certificates so that the most fun individuals get little certificates. They can put them on their desk. They can see how many they get. And at this point, there's probably so much fun happening that it may be beyond what the chief fun officer can do to monitor and track all this fun. And so at this point, we want to decentralize, push control down to the teams. So each team can have a chief fun assessor who can look around them, see who's having fun, and then report it upwards to the chief fun officer. And finally, of course, what's fun? Fun, fun is laughter. So make sure to laugh out loud at least once a day. And that, that way, you can sort of create a, a culture where, where fun is shared. So any, any questions so far? Everybody happy with this approach to fun? <laughs> There's a question, but I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> so um, so let's, let's sort of switch gears a little bit. Because um, I, I, I mentioned already, and, 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 and Joe mentioned that question of, why are you here? Um, you know, is every, are you here because you're expecting fun? Is, is there miserable people downstairs? Um, and, and speaking about fun is kind of an interesting thing. Um, because probably when, when you, know, you were sort of making the, the, the case to, to your management to send you here, you, know, you said, oh, there's this really great conference and there's, there's lots of really good talks. And you know, I'm good, really going to see a big business benefit if I go to the session on and you probably chose something like making my Docker containers smaller or, or something like that. And you probably didn't say, boss, you need to tell, send me this, to this conference so I can learn how to be more fun. You know, we, don't, we don't really, we sort of, probably have read some things that say, oh, fun is good for the workplace and that kind of thing, but we don't talk about it. It's this, it's this dirty little secret. Um, and I have to say that's true even for me. Um, so if you Google me, you will see that I have done some speaking on fun. I have done some writing on fun. Um, it's not my main job, but you know, I, I, I have done it. But if you look at my LinkedIn profile, that's actually not my LinkedIn profile. Nowhere on my LinkedIn profile do I say, hey, I really like having fun at work, because um, I sort of keep my LinkedIn profile you know, kind of serious and professional, and I don't really talk about fun. And, and you know, this is not just me. This is, this is everywhere. So if you look up how to write a powerful CV, you know, there's all these words that you can put on. So you can say, I trained this, and I built that, and I, I oversaw that, and I improved that. And nowhere does it say, and by the way, I really like fun. You know, it's not the kind of thing that we talk about in a professional context. It's this, it's this little secret. So why is fun something that's so unacceptable, or at least something that we sort of pretend that we don't actually want to have at work? Well, I think in order to understand that, we probably want to track back a bit and think, well, what is fun? What, you know? Um, so fun is all about jokes. So I, I, this is one of my favorite slides in this talk. Um, this is one that I wrote, not Martine. And every time I present it, I sort of wait for the audience to like roar with laughter. And every time there's this stony silence. <laughs> and I sort of think, oh, that's so sad. Um, and I eventually decided, oh, maybe it's because you know, I'm, I'm speaking on the continent and they're not native speakers. So I explained it. And uh, you know, fun guy, and that's a mushroom. And a mushroom is a fun guy. And then I kind of got it. Um, but I can't even use that excuse here, because I suspect many of you are native speakers and you still don't think it's funny. But I think it's funny, and it's my slides, so I get to leave it in. So we'll move swiftly on from the fun guy um, and go to something um, more serious, which is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, Another way, you know, we sort of have this one, and then we have the, the modern one, which has Wi-Fi at the top and, and power at the second. But, but the basic idea, really, is that there's a set of things that we need in order to, you know, be OK. Um, we need, we have physiological needs. You know, I need to eat. I need to sleep. If I don't, bad things happen. Um, next up from that need is safety. So, you know, I really want to know that I'm not going to be murdered in my bed and that kind of thing. That makes me, you know, more happy. And then. So the, above that, then we get into the things that are fun. Um, so not being murdered in my bed, 
obviously that's a good thing, but that doesn't really count as fun. That's just sort of table stakes. Um, above that, then we get into things like my social interactions with other people, my esteem, how I feel about myself, and then this top one, which is really vague, which is self-actualization. So fun at the top, not fun at the bottom. Um, but that's not quite enough, actually, because not everything at the, in that top is fun. There's lots of things that improve your self-esteem that aren't particularly fun. So can we, be, can we be a bit more rigorous about this still? Well, it turns out um, that there is a ton of research on fun. So you can have titles with rivet or papers with riveting titles like fun, an exploration in its relevance to interaction design. And you, know, you can go on. And, and the, there's sort of a <laughs> an, an interesting thing, which is that I think if you research fun, then that sort of drains the fun out of it. And you meet people at a party and they say, what do you do? And they, you say, I research fun. And they say, is it fun? And you say, no, actually, it was fun 10 years ago, and now it's not. Um, but from, from that paper, the, the sort of the, the key point in terms of defining fun is that fun is a point on the intersection of engagement levels and social interaction for a given activity. Um, so <laughs> um, I think that that definition is fun, sort of. Well, actually, it's not fun. Um, but it's sort of interesting, sort of. But it's not really even useful, um, which bring, bring, brings me back to when fun is your job, then it becomes not fun. So be aware, should you ever think of becoming a fun researcher. Um, so going back to this idea of, of combining the social interaction level and the engagement level, uh, if you have those two, then you can do a graph. And that graph is called the continuum. So if you remember one thing from this talk, um, then you can go back and you can say, yeah, boss, I learned all about the continuum. Yeah, but very, very serious. Um, so I still, I'm not sure, I think the continuum is fun. Um, but I'm not sure it's particularly useful in terms of practical next steps. So uh, instead, I think it's more useful to think about a bit of a, a taxonomy of fun. Um, so one, at one end, we have exploration, which is sort of a, a focused investigation. Then we have play, which is uh, sort of uh, flexible for its own sake. Then from there, we have a puzzle, which has a goal and rules. Games are similar to a puzzle, but they have a winner and rules. And then somewhere in the middle is work, which has a goal, but no, well, it, has, it sort of has rules, but sort of doesn't, so I'll come back to that. So what are some, some examples of these? Um, so exploration, if you think about what a child does, or certainly, you know, a very young baby, everything that they do is exploration. So they, you know, you give them things and they shake it and they go, ooh, it makes a noise. And then, you know, you've got the little um, zip and then they pull the zip and they go, ooh, it makes a noise. Um, when they get a bit older, then you, they can do things like puzzles. So you can have something like a Rubik's Cube. In between the two, you see a lot of play. Um, so things like, I've got a little scenario and I'm going to move my little animals around. And sometimes um, I look at children playing and I think, why are you doing that? Why is that interesting? I wouldn't do that. But it's, play is very subjective. So what, what can hold one person's attention to play doesn't necessarily hold, hold another person's. And then getting more structured, we have things like games. And then we have work, which, as I said, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to. Um, and the, the common thing with all of these, so there's different you know, criteria. Does it have rules? Does it not have rules? Um, but what really defines them all, and I think defines fun, is what we call positive affect. Um, and that's just really a fancy way of saying it feels good. So people who are having fun are smiling, they're laughing, they look happy. Um, which is probably something that you could have told me 20 minutes ago, um, but now we can be a bit more structured about it. Um, and how this relates to programming is that programming is fun. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why programming is so fun is that it's a combination of this, this logical aspect, this problem-solving aspect, and then as well this creative aspect of, look, I'm going to make something. I'm, I'm going to make something that's never been made before. Um, and then ultimately, I think it, again, it's sort of it's similar to that child with the with the little thingy that you know you get to control stuff when you program and stuff happens. So instead of exploration, what we do when we're programming is we do hello world, and it's it's exactly the same idea. And we have puzzles when we're programming too, of course. Um, so instead of getting the Rubik's cube, we get the stack trace of doom, and it usually takes about as long to figure out why is that stack trace happening as it does to solve a Rubik's cube. Uh, games are a little, a little bit, you know, less obvious, but actually we have a lot of games as well. Um, 
so this is the velocity board from, from one of our projects. And velocity is hugely gamified as a way of, of doing a measurement in, that, in terms of how it's shared. And you know, each squad wants to maximize their velocity. But ultimately, again, all, you know, what all of this comes back to is that positive affect. So I love this photo. So this is Katie Booman, and she's you know, discovering that her algorithm for imaging black holes worked. And I think that's, you know, that's something that all of us have had, where you know, we're at the computer and we're trying to make something work. And either it's a short project or it's a long project, but then we get that moment where we go, yes, it worked, and it feels so good. Um, so that's, that's really good. But then the question is, how many of those, yes, it feels so good moments do we have? Or, you know, because a lot of us, you know, are sort of thinking, I like those moments, I recognize those moments, but they don't happen as often as I like, and why is my workplace not fun? A lot of it comes back to this, this management model that, you know, was, was developed in the 1980s and 90s, and it was all about command and control, so, you know, super hierarchical, autonomy is a bad thing, it's all about the people who have the MBAs at the top telling everybody uh, underneath them what to do, and technology is, is not, you know, a driver of business or a driver of good. Technology is just a cost center. And this model actually dates back even further than that. Um, so this model dates back to the military. And the military is, was the, pretty much the first large-scale employer in the world. Um, obviously, people were working before then, but they were usually working either in small family businesses or on a little feudal estate or something like that. Whereas the military took thousands of people and had to try and organize them. And so then that meant that they had to put in structures like command and control. And it was particularly important for the military uh, because instead of saying, I'd like you to deploy this Docker container or something like that, what they're saying in the military is one of two things. Um, either I'd like you to go kill this person, which doesn't sound particularly enjoyable, or I'd like you to go and be killed, which sounds even less employable or enjoyable. So then you, know, you do really need a structure where when some, someone tells you what to do, you don't have your own bright ideas about how it would be better to not be killed today, thank you very much, so maybe you'll just hang back at the back. You, know, you, you do what you're told. Um, and, and these ideas about, about fun, so we have this, you know, this sort of employment structure that came from the military. Although actually, interestingly, even the military is changing. Um, so the military now do have much more of a model of autonomy as well, where they'll take a team and they'll give the team a definition of the mission, but they won't tell the team how to achieve that mission, and it really is up to the, to the team, so everything does change. But it, it's not just the military that these ideas come from. Um, a lot of these ideas come back as well to, to um, Western religious values that, you know, maybe you know, we sort of don't think about consciously, but they're still somewhere down in our sort of, in our cultural subconscious. Um, so this is a picture of a Puritan confronting ale drinkers. And the, the Puritans were interesting um, because the Puritans did something um, that we, we talk a lot about now, which is that the Puritans canceled Christmas. And so it was canceled for, for several decades. And the reason that the Puritans canceled Christmas was because it wasn't Christian enough. And the reason it wasn't Christian enough was because there was too much fun being had at, at Christmas. Um, so we have, you know, we have this idea that, that fun is kind of bad. So then we definitely don't want to talk about fun in, in the workplace. Um, but of course, you know, the, the reason why I'm here is that there is such a lot of value of, of fun in the workplace. Um, and, and this idea that fun helps work is a really, really old one, older even than the Puritan one, Puritans. So Aristotle said, Pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. And I think that's something that we can all un emphasize with, you know, that if we enjoy something, we do a way better job than if it's a job that, you know, we don't really want to do, and we just kind of half arse it just to, you know, make sure that it's okay. But, you know, we, whereas if, if we really care, we do a much better job. And th this, is, um, this is IBM's IoT Center in, in Munich. Um, and I visited the building, because I saw the photo and I was like, is it really that big? And I visited it and it is really that big. Um, but the thing I like about this building is that when you walk in, you see this sign, um, which is a quote from one of IBM's fellows. And it says, you must make the time to play to be creative. So I love that he said it, and I extra love that someone in IBM that said, you know, this is so good that we're gonna put this on the wall so that everybody who comes to this huge, shiny corporate building sees this message that we say play is really important. Um, and of course, if you're doing IoT, then I, I, 
I really like IoT, and, and the reason I like it is because it does involve so much play. Um, but the, in the IoT Center in Munich, they've, they've got a couple of floors, and then BMW have some of the other floors, and so then they've got a partnership as well, which means that if you're in the I IoT Center in Munich, you do get to play, but your toys are much better than the toys that most of us get. So they took this BMW i8 and they instrumented it with IoT, and it's all very cool, and I'm not jealous at all. Right, so stepping away from the BMWs, there, there is a ton of research that shows funds good for business. So, you know, you can just like keep finding papers that show it. Um, and what most of these study, studies show is that if employees are having fun, then there's less sick leave, which kind of makes sense because, you know, they don't get sick from stress. They work harder. And as a result, there's more productivity. So it's sort of good all around. Um, and so this is an article in the Harvard Business Review, and, and the, the statistic that they had was that your brain at positive is 31% more product productive than your brain at negative, neutral, or stressed. So that's a huge difference. If you could go to your boss and say, hey, I know how to make us 31% more productive, your boss would be like, yeah, do it. And then you'd say it involves fun, and your boss would be like, oh, okay, maybe I'm not so sure about that. Um, and there's sort of an interesting question here about, well, how do I get that, you know, how do I get more, more positive, um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more. Um, but certainly you sort of think, yeah, this is nice to say, but getting into a more positive state of mind isn't as simple as just watching cat videos. Um, but actually research shows that getting into a positive state of mind is literally as simple as watching cat videos. So if they, if they, they, they did a study um, and they showed people comedy videos, um, they didn't specify that it was cat videos, but I think we can assume it's cat videos because the internet is for cats. Um, and individuals who had just watched the video were approximately 12% more productive, so they gave them a little test after the video. <laughs> Um, so you can't spend all of your time watching cat videos because then you wouldn't actually see the productivity gain. But, you know, this kind of light relief has a really valuable place in the workplace. And ultimately that's because your brain needs breaks. And if your brain has a break, you'll be able to approach a task better. And there's lots of other, um, other reasons why fun is good. So this is um, a Dutch consulting company. And they, they had this bright idea that what they really wanted in their office was Lego trains. So I, I, I think the conversation went something like, hey, you need to buy us Lego trains for the office. No, I don't. Uh, and then they, they, then they sort of managed to make a case for it. Um, and so in the end, the, they did get corporate funding for their, for their trains. And they saw a lot of benefits from it. Uh, so one was that now when they go to recruitment fairs, everybody else has a booth and they have a huge Lego train. Um, and and they're, you know, they're, they're speaking at conferences about it and that kind of thing. And, and as well, um, one of the things that they did with the Lego trains was that they were a Java shop and they wanted to learn Scala, but they didn't really want to learn Scala on their production system for, for obvious reasons. So they, what they told the employees is, hey, if you learn Scala, you can play with the Lego trains. And so everybody went, I want to learn Scala, I want to learn Scala. So you know, it ended up being this, this enablement mechanism. And one of the really interesting things about fun, too, is it's, you know, it's obviously good for the brain because, you know, our, our, if we have fun, that happens in the brain, and then you sort of expect that it will change how your brain works. But it's really good for the body, too. So this, I, I, was, um, I was in Yorkshire over Easter, and I saw this sign on a farm. And I thought, oh. So if you take piglets and you let them play, they actually grow f faster. So... The, the, I think the eventual outcome for the piglet isn't maybe so happy, um, but the eventual outcome for the farmer is really good, that by, by allowing their piglets to have fun, they actually get a bigger physical yield for, for their piglets. So this is all really good. So then, you know, can you watch cat videos at work all day? Well, probably not. There, there is a limit um, to how much fun you can probably expect to have. Um, and so this is the last fungi joke, by the way. So this is like a group of fungi showing... Never mind. Okay, moving on. So, so there are limits to fun. Um, so I think, you know, a, a lot of us, we sort of don't want to do stuff that isn't fun. So if we only did stuff that was fun, is that going to work? Is, is, is it going to be good? Well, no, you know, we do all still have to wash the dishes. We do still need to be self-disciplined and, and maybe do some things that we don't particularly want to do. Um, And there's sort of a, a logical thing as well, because fun is good, but just because it's fun doesn't mean it's good. Not all things that are fun are, 
are good. Um, so, for example, within, you know, when they, they've done some research into internet trolling, and they find that the people who are doing the trolling are having an absolutely fantastic time. They think this is one of the best things they've done all day. Um, for the people on the other side, it doesn't feel so good. So, you know, you really have to ask yourself, is everybody having fun here? Or is it just me who's having fun while I'm creating sort of a wave of misery and napalm around me? Um, and, and, you know, this can be big things or it can be little things. And sometimes it's not at all malicious. Um, so, so many years ago, when, when Groovy was just starting as a, as a language, um, one of our developers wanted to learn Groovy, and he had, you know, sort of a, a set of, of code that he was, in, you know, he needed to, to build up, and he thought, okay, well, cool, I'll, I'll do this in Groovy. Um, so he thought this was great. It was really rewarding for him. He learned loads. Um, but then, unfortunately, he left the company. Um, and so then the rest of us had this pile of Groovy code, and we didn't know Groovy. We maybe wanted to learn Groovy sometime, but like not right now when we had a deadline. Um, and so it ended up causing sort of a lot of stress uh, around. Um, so, you know, really fun, like many things, it should be enjoyed, but it should be enjoyed responsibly. So then the question is, well, I'm sold on fun. I think I can maybe, maybe sell my boss on the idea of, of of fun, but maybe without the cat videos? Are there other, other ways that we can get fun without the cat videos? Well, yes. Um, so, and again, this, you know, this is really gonna depend on your corporate culture. What, what flies in one culture doesn't fly in another. Safety critical industries tend to have this really sort of unrelaxed uh, approach to fun. Um, so the first, the first step in, in having fun is to find the unfun things and get rid of them. Um, although actually, I've given this talk a few times, and after I've given it, sometimes people have come up and told me stories about their workplaces, and I realized that I actually had the first step wrong. So the first step isn't to, to get rid of unfun. The first step is to stop prohibiting fun, um, which again seems obvious, but workplaces are surprising. Um, so I, I heard a story, and they had a culture where they had a kitchen, and people would bring in cake, and, and they were told by HR that they couldn't use the company resource email system to send emails about things that were non-work relevant like cake. Like I don't, I don't even understand how, how that happens, um, but that was, that was the message. Um, I heard another story and, and they had, again, this, you know, this is back in the days when internet was a, a slightly precious commodity and they were a distributed support team and so they'd be working really hard nine to five and then after five they'd sort of as a team building exercise, they'd all play Doom or Quake, and you know, they'd use the company servers to, to get the connectivity to, to have a little bit of a LAN party. Um, and this, this had a ton of benefits because they you know, it built the team, they all got to play with each other, you know, they knew each other better, they, they pulled in the same direction at work because of that. And they were told, if you're in the office after 5.30, you have to be doing work. Which again, I don't even understand the, the mentality of, of, of that. Um, and I heard an, another story, and it, it, it was someone, he was, he was sort of working away, and you know, he was smiling as he coded, and a project manager kind of crept up behind him and said, why are you smiling? This isn't a place to be happy. Which, like if I was a project manager, and I saw my team smiling, I'd think, great, they're in control. They're gonna meet the deadline. Everything's happy, they're in their zone of competence. This is good. I wouldn't tell them to not smile, but apparently some project managers do. So th this was in Switzerland, so I don't know if it's different in Switzerland. <laughs> but, um, so going back, assuming that we don't have the kind of culture where we actually prohibit fun, then we can go on to getting rid of the unfun things. And I, I mentioned this earlier, but usually the things that we hate most, the things that are unfun, are the things that don't add value. So if something is unfun, that's a really good red flag, that it's not adding value. So we can get rid of unfun things because they're waste. So then we get this double benefit that we got rid of the unfun and we got rid of the waste. Um, and in, in a lot of, you know, we talked a lot today already about autonomy, um, but letting people make their own decisions is so important because one of the reasons that people like to make their own decisions is because they know that what they're being told to, to do by their manager is probably wrong because their manager is more separated from the context of the problem than they are. So if you, let, if you push that control down, you get a better outcome. And in terms of the, the, the things that maybe most of us have that are not so much fun, like meetings and criticism and you know, this sort of meaningless ceremony, um, 
the, the good news is that we know that pretty much all of these have better alternatives. Um, so instead of being in meetings, maybe we could be actually programming and doing our job. And, and you, know, all, you know, all of these things have something where basically we can fix it. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about, about some of these, um, but I just sort of want to leave that, that up there as well to show that there are, that there are solutions. Um, so a while ago, I saw a little survey on, um, on Twitter, and it kind of made me stop and think, because she asked, well, how much time are most of you spending programming? And you can see that the depressing answer is that even though we became programmers because we like to program, um, about 70% of us are spending less than half of our time programming. And I looked at that, and I was definitely spending way less than half my time programming. And so I sort of, you know, I posted that, and then I thought about it, and I was like, wait a minute, I should, I should be able to fix this. So can I get rid of the stuff that's stopping me do, doing what I enjoy? Um, so I went to management and I said, we're short staffed, which was true. Um, so you're going to have to cancel all of my meetings for a month so that I can, I can just do, do programming. And the really cool thing was it actually worked. So it didn't, it sort of after a month my meetings resumed, but you know, I had, I had this, um, I was able to change something that I had thought wasn't changeable. Um, and one thing that drives a lot of us crazy is interruptions. And, and th there are some techniques that we can use to, to fix those. Um, so what, what some teams do is they have an interrupt pair. Because of course people are going to have questions, you know, questions need to be answered. But you can say, well this is the, the interrupt pair, so please don't interrupt those people who are busy thinking, just interrupt the interrupt pair. <coughs> Meetings, of course, I don't think anybody really likes meetings, um, but one thing that we do to protect ourselves from meetings is pair programming. And the reason for that is because if you, if you interrupt a pair, you're interrupting both of them. And so then management can kind of see that the cost of that meeting is double. So we sort of block out our whole calendar and we say, oh yes, we have you know, a stand up and we have iteration planning meeting and a retro and that kind of thing. But basically we are pairing and please do not interrupt us. And it works, it works pretty well. Um, pair programming as well, I think is super effective. Um, one is because of, it gives you that protection from meetings, um, but the other thing is that it really improves the flow as well. So with a code review, you have to do your code, put in your pull request, and then wait for the review, and that can sometimes take a long time. It's an interruption for the person who's doing the review, um, and so it ends up being sort of bad on both sides, and then you end up with bad patterns as well, so you end up batching big amounts of work because you don't want to have to wait for, the, pull, for the, um, the code review, which means for the person doing the code review, they, they put off doing it because it's an even bigger piece of work and you get into this cycle. And the, the other really bad thing that happens is that by the time you get the code review, you can see that there's maybe something that wasn't right in the design, but that was quite a lot of work ago. So you don't want to say, oh, you need to throw this all away because that would be too depressing for the person on the other end. So instead you say, oh, well, that semicolon on line three isn't quite in the right place. And I noticed that there's a tab rather than a space there. And you, you end up bike shedding on these little things. And it doesn't really add value. It just sort of is going through the motions of, of code quality. And, and the person you know, getting reviewed doesn't have the opportunity to learn. Estimates is another one where sometimes, sometimes there's a really good reason to do an estimate. Um, but sometimes there really isn't a reason to do an estimate, and we just sort of go through pointing our stories for the sake of it. But th there's a lot of evidence that shows that if you just sort of size your stories to be sort of sensible sizes, the number of stories, you, you can predict the number of stories that you do pretty much exactly as well as you can predict a velocity based on points. So you can skip this whole sizing meeting and just use the number of stories as your progress indicator instead. Um, TDD, I think, is super fun. Um, so, so, you know, TDD shouldn't be something we do just at the end. We should be testing all the way through. Um, and I really like TDD as well because it has that sort of gamified aspect that, you know, it's red and then you make it go green and you go, yay, yay I win. Um, automation is, an, again, something, you know, at the moment computers don't expect to have fun. Um, it may be that that's going to change and then they're going to come back and have like a horrible vengeance on all the people who wrote automated really boring tasks. Um, but until then, like until we're confirmed that Skynet's there, just give boring stuff to the computers because that's what they're there for. Um, and then there's, you know, the sort of the bonus as well is that actually doing the automation is fun. So it's a double win that you don't have the crap and you had the fun. 
Status in PowerPoint is really expensive and it's usually inaccurate. So make dynamic passive status that's just there. Anybody who wants to know can see it, but you're not spending time reporting status. And I have been in stand-up meetings that lasted for an hour. That is not fun. That is not effective. So a stand-up should be short. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of these really, you know, these sort of themes, they, they fit in with what we've talked about today and, and what, what we're going to talk about tomorrow as well, you know, which is a lot of the sort of the practices that we do for continuous integration or continuous delivery or continuous deployment or continuous life of what cycle or if we just give up and say just continuous stuff. Um, but, you know, ultimately all of it, it's, it's aimed at getting rid of that tedious stuff. It's aimed at getting rid of that waste stuff. And so I think a, a principle that you can hold for all of it is that it should feel fun and that maybe if your continuous stuff isn't feeling fun, you're doing it wrong. So once we've done all that, then hopefully the workplace is way better already. Um, and at that point, we can go and add fun. So some of this can be sort of, you know, your, your classic kind of Silicon Valley fun of, of ping pong and that kind of thing. And this has a lot of, of value um, because, as I said, your brain needs breaks. And if you have a break that involves exercise, that's even better. So, oh, you just saw, um, so I, this is my team playing ping pong. And so I was videoing them playing ping pong. And then at some point they sort of noticed that I was making a video of them playing ping pong. And then they sort of look over and they're like, why are you videoing us? It's all okay. Um, and I, I talked a, a bit earlier about that taxonomy of, of fun. And can, you know, when we're at work and we're not playing ping pong, can that be fun? And I think it actually totally can. So when we have, you know, at work we have a goal, but achieving that goal can be totally fun. So, whoops. <laughs> um, so gamification is sort of a, a classic example of fun in the workplace. And gamification has the benefit that when you go to your boss and you say, yeah, I'm going to add fun to the workplace, and they go, oh, and you say, I'm going to gamify everything, and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm totally down with that. Um, because it, you know, it sort of has an obvious appeal for management because games have a goal. So, so when you gamify things, then you can say, look, we've achieved this goal. So Stack Overflow, for example, gamified internet support, and it completely revolutionized it because before Stack Overflow was awful, and now with Stack Overflow, it's you know, pretty okay. Um, and we see a lot of gamification in, in lots of areas. So when we do security education, now we do um, the OWASP boot camp. And the way you do it isn't that you read a thing and then you like answer questions. The way you do it is that you have to hack the website that's hosting the certification in order to actually um, pass the boot camp, which I think is, is cool, right? Because it's, it's a puzzle. Um, and, and TDD, you know, TDD, I think, is better than other forms of testing just because it does have that gamified aspect. And you can gamify anything, right? So, so build status, you know, when you, have, um, when you have a build radiator, that's kind of gamified. If you go out and you buy the Siren of Shame, which is a real website, um, then, then you've really, really gamified your build status. Um, and like everything is being gamified now, so um, we're seeing a lot of gamified recruitment. So sometimes apparently when you get into an Uber, the, it's a, if the taxi driver thinks you sort of look like a likely Uber candidate, they'll give you a little quiz. Um, and the military are gamifying recruitment as well, so you know, they have, they have dedicated games, and then if you really enjoy playing their games, then they'll think, oh, well, you enjoy p killing people in the game, so maybe you'll enjoy killing people in real life even more. <laughs> um, and, and I, I saw a talk um, recently, and what they did done is they sort of realized that they had about 10 years of technical debt, and they thought, how are we ever going to address this? You know, it's just hopeless. The mountain is too big. And then they said, ah, we can gamify it. Um, so they used sonar as, as their metric. Um, and what they managed to achieve was they got about 7,000 new lines of test coverage. Um, they got about 1,000 new tests added, and they fixed 230 issues. So that was, you know, a huge achievement. Um, and, yeah, they, they sort of cleared this 10 years of tech debt. Um, and so you sort of say, okay, so what, what was the amazing reward that drove all of this behavior? Um, and the reward was a pizza. It was one free lunch. And with this offer of one free lunch, they managed to get people to do all of that work. So at, at that ratio, sort of, so one free lunch for 230 issues fixed. So it's basically like, I don't know, 
20 issues per piece of pepperoni or something like that. But if, you know, people don't think about it in that terms, they think about it in terms of the glory and the fame and stuff. Um, and the metrics are really important. So they had to do a few iterations to find the right metrics um, because ultimately you do get what you measure. And so one disadvantage of gamification is it can drive people to have behaviors that are not necessarily helpful. So this was another case where they were using gamification around their, their coverage. Um, but what they discovered was happening was that people were checking in empty tests in order to drive the metrics up. So, you know, people get so excited by the reward that they forget the reason why. Um, and I, I heard another story recently, and, and there's sort of, sort of crowdsourcing for labeling um, for AI on moon maps and that kind of thing. And they considered gamifying it, and then they realized that everybody who does it is a volunteer. You know, they're only doing it to advance science. But if they put in gamification, then people would start mislabeling things just so that they could go faster. Because people were so motivated by the reward that they stopped to think, well, the only reason I'm doing this is to advance science, and yet I'm actually hurting science because I'm being motivated by the reward. Um, so gamification does need to be done with caution. Um, <laughs> And another hazard of gamification, is, of course, is that, you know, people aren't stupid, or at least people aren't stupid all of the time. So, you know, they may eventually notice, wait a minute, I've just been gamified. Um, so, now, so I want to talk a bit about play, because gamification, it sort of has an obvious work relevance, but play is just as important. So play is how we learn. Um, and so, you know, it is, I, I, went to a talk just before this one, and they were talking about how their, in, uh, their um, engineers were, um, were playing with a new technology. And then he sort of corrected himself. Uh, they, they weren't playing with a new technology. They were investigating the new technology. But of course, they were exactly playing with the new technology because it was new, and they were learning it. Um, and there's a lot of value. Like, again, you can't say this to your management, but there's so much value in quirkiness, too. Um, so this is um, my old team who developed Webs for Liberty. And when they put up the website for it, they had this little logo. And if you expand it, it's peace, love, and play, which is just sweet and nice. Um, and if you look on some of the stack overflows, you can see some content that has no value <coughs> except because people just wanted to, you know, were feeling playful. Um, so you can find questions like, how do I create an XKC style diagram in tech? And you can get a lot of answers. So people spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make tech, make, make these diagrams. Um, more, more, more. <laughs> There's a lot of answers. Um, but this is my favorite, which is, how do I make my document look like it was written by a Cthulhu warp shipping madman? Um, and again, you know, you can, there was lots of answers, but someone you know, came up with that. Um, and a lot of software has, has Easter eggs. So did, um, if I say the word, the, f the word gullible isn't in the dictionary, is that a familiar joke to people? OK, cool. Because um, I keep saying that joke to people, and they keep saying, what? So, so back in the, um, with the Next, it was a beautiful, well-designed, well-engineered system. And it had this visual dictionary, which was really cool, so one of the first ones. Um, and if you went to that dictionary and you typed in gullible, what it would show you was the picture of yourself that it had picked up from your user, um, user, user profile. And nobody made them do that. They just thought, oh, this would be cool. We can use this technology. And, and this is one of our release trains. And they put like a whole bunch of little icons in, and they had like a little fat controller just to do the release train, just to, because it was, it was nice. And you know, with all of these things, you know, it's about the feedback. And it's about we do something, and then we get a reaction. And, that, and that's cool. So. Is it possible to get fun wrong? <laughs> yes, it absolutely is. Um, so I think when people say, I want to make my workplace more fun, one of the first things that they do, um, if it's not gamification, is these team building activities. And so there's a, a statistic that 31% of us dislike team building activities. That's an American statistic, so I suspect actually here the number is, is way higher. Um, <laughs> and I think, again, you know, one of the reasons that people are uncomfortable with these team building activities is because they do have the suspicion that they're being forced to have fun and nobody likes being told what to do. And they also sometimes, I think, have a feeling that, you know, th they're, they're being measured. Um, and sometimes it is actually true. So I heard this, this really sad story. It was about um, an office party. They had a barbecue. And what they did was they took attendance at the barbecue to make sure that everybody was having the right amount of fun at the barbecue. So, of course, you know, what, had, what was supposed to be a nice thing ended up being think, something that just made people think that their workplace was even more horrible than they'd realized. 
So really, you know, if you forget to fix the other stuff, you will fail at fun. Um, and one, one other example of this um, is I think a lot of us think, oh, if I got paid to do something that other people paid to do, that would be like totally winning at life. Um, and then you <coughs> investigate the job of being a games tester. And then you realize that it's really not the best job in the world and that it is possible to do something that is fun and not have fun at it. Um, and so if you take you know, a toxic workplace and you add this like, superficial layer of fun and then everything else is horrible, that doesn't actually make it better. And that doesn't even keep it neutral. That actually makes it way worse. So to summarize, fun's really important. Um, to achieve fun, the first thing you have to do is get rid of the unfun things. Once, you, once you've done that, and only once you've done that, then you can add fun things. And so with that, I will leave it. Um, I, I won't take questions here, partly because I'm at time, um, but I'm very happy to, to hang around and talk to you and ask questions and answer questions and that kind of thing. So thank you very much. <laughs>